Please welcome Robert Kopp, Associate Director, Rutgers Energy Institute, Associate Professor, Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, Rutgers University. how we can use what we learn about the past to improve our projections of what's going to happen in the future, and how we can use those projections of the future to improve our estimates of the risks of climate change and inform policy decisions. So I'm not a food person. Uh, so this has been a really interesting uh, time here for me. Um, I've learned a lot. It's very exciting to see some of the work you guys are doing. I'm also not, in particular, a climate and food person, except in as much as the food system is part of the broader economy. But I do know that 10,000 years ago, as first farmers were sowing the seeds of our global civilization in the Middle East, the Earth was coming out of a long, slow period of global warming. Over about the past 10,000 years, or so, previous 10,000 years or so, the planet had warmed up by about 7 degrees Fahrenheit, and the giant ice sheet that would have covered us here under about a mile of ice had retreated away. And what followed was of 10,000 years of a relatively mild and stable climate. We're now entering another period of climate change as a result of an innovation that slowly emerged out of that global civilization, namely the discovery of fossil fuels and the ability to release the energy stored in those fossil fuels. So over the last 35 years or so, Global average temperatures have risen by about a quarter of a degree every decade. And 2015, with a temperature that looks to be about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit above the 19th century average, is set to be the warmest year on record. As a result of this warming, we're seeing a lot more heat extremes and significantly fewer cold extremes. And we're also pumping the atmosphere full of water vapor. So we've seen an increase in the intensity of rainfalls. So if you're in the, new, the Northeast, over the last 60 years or so, we've seen about a 70% increase in the amount of rainfall following, falling in the top 1% of precipitation events. So it's not just your imagination that the rains and snows are falling harder. As a consequence of these sorts of trends in temperature and rainfall, we're starting to see real statistically detectable effects on global food production. So these figures here are showing you estimates of how over the last 40 years or so, temperature and precipitation trends have affected production of corn and wheat in different places around the world. And you can see in the right-hand figure that there are some countries, particularly those at low latitude, where about six months of production have been lost over the course of those nearly 40 years <laughs> as a result of these changes in climate. Meanwhile, we're also warming the oceans. We're seeing clear evidence in, the, in fisheries of not just overfishing, although that's probably the largest signal we've seen, as we heard this morning, but also migration of, of warmer water fishes to higher latitudes. And we know the reason, as I've said, that's underlying this change. It's the carbon dioxide we're pumping into the atmosphere. In 2014, a global civilization pumped about 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which was... Uh, almost the most in human history, of which the vast majority, about 88%, came from fossil fuels. The second largest contributor was land use change, driven primarily by the global agricultural system, with the residual being primarily due to cement production. Now, I'm going to focus on the risks that climate change poses to the food system, but as you all know, Agriculture is also part of the problem and part of the solution to dealing with climate change and limiting these changes. If we look at all greenhouse gases, as we can see in this figure, agriculture and land use change account for about a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions. That's carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and some smaller gases. And if we look on the right and we see where that comes from, nearly half of that is coming from either land use changes driven by the sort of price signals in the agricultural system or peat fires, which are really just an expression of those land use changes. We think we heard about those earlier in Indonesia. Of the residual, about a quarter of total agricultural and land use emissions are due to either synthetic fertilizer or manure management or soil management, and about 20% come out of the guts of ruminants like cattle and sheep. So all of these sectors are areas where agriculture has a contribution to make to limiting the overall problem. 
But it is not just an environmental problem, as we often think about climate change. It's really a much more deeply rooted civilizational challenge. Um, it's an economic risk issue. And so two years ago, um, the Risky Business Project, led by Mayor Bloomberg, uh, former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, and Tom Steyer, came to me and to my colleagues at Rhodium Group and to my colleague Salman Chung at Berkeley and asked us to conduct an economic risk assessment of the climate risks facing the United States. I'm going to highlight a couple of the results of that work that are most particularly relevant to the food system. You can get all the details either in, you know, in, the, in the summary report at riskybusiness.org or in our book that came out last month, which you can read more about at climateprospectus.org. So, Risk, when you think about risk, it's really about uncertainty and managing uncertainty. And of course, the fact that something's uncertain is not a reason to ignore it or to do something or not do anything about it. It's uncertain whether you're going to be burgled tomorrow or have your house set on fire, but you still take precautions. You, set, you, you lock your doors, you buy, buy insurance. And similarly, you know, when we think about risk, it, it's really the most important thing is to assess that risk so we can then figure out what the best strategy is for managing it. Now, the first and largest source of uncertainty when we think about climate change is a decision we have to make as a society. It's how much we're going to continue to emit into the atmosphere. And so the way you deal with that in, uh, scenario, in, in risk analysis, that, that fundamental choice, is through scenario analysis. And so in our analysis, we used some scenarios that the climate science and economics modeling community writ large has come up with. Um, I'll make you learn a little bit of technology, they're called, uh, terminology. They're called representative concentration pathways. But basically, you can think of it as three different levels of choices we can make. So the red curve, the yellow curve, and the green curve. So the red curve, what we call RCP 8.5, is essentially continued fossil fuel intensive growth. Um, that would lead to a near doubling of our current 40 billion tons of CO2 emitted by the middle of the century and to around 100 billion tons of CO2 emitted every year by 2080. The middle path is one that stabilizes emissions around their current level for the remainder of the first half of the century and then slowly brings them down over the second half of the century. And then that bottom path um, leads to a reduction of about 60% by the middle of the century and brings emissions down to zero by 2080. Now, each of these different paths has different implications for global average temperature. Uh, so that top path, uh, there's a results in a likely temperature increase of about 6 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit above the 19th century level. And this is a reminder, we're around 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit above the 19th century level today. The middle path limits that reduction to around 3.5 to 6 degrees, increase to around 3.5 to 6 degrees Fahrenheit. And that bottom path, yields a warming of about 2.4 to 4 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you convert that into Celsius, that's around 1.3 to 2.2 degrees Celsius. And those of you who have been following climate policy know that there is sort of a nominal international target of around 2 degrees Celsius. So that bottom green path is sort of the path that's most consistent with what the leaders of the world have agreed to through processes like the UN Convention on Climate Change. So those are global average temperature responses. But to uh, sort of assess risk, you need to recognize the fact that nobody lives at the global average. Everybody lives in a specific space. And as well, nobody lives at the 20-year you know, average. Everybody lives day to day. So we need a way of turning those numbers into specific real-life real experience. Um, and so we tapped into the vast amount of work that's been put into global climate models together with some innovations we developed um, to come up with a what we call probability distribution of um, future climate change. So here are just two slices through that. So on the left, you're looking at average summer temperatures over the last 30 years um, in the US. And on the right, you're looking at sort of the middle road projection for the high emission scenario. Um, and you can see that red creeping north as we look into that, um, that particular future. And because we're looking at probability distribution, we can make statements like, if we're on that high emissions trajectory, there's about an 80% chance by the middle of the century that summers in New York City will be warmer than they are in North Carolina over the last 30 years. Whereas if we get on that lowest emissions trajectory, there is about an 80% chance that they won't be. Right? So this is you know, uncertainty, but these are different uncertainties, and we can weigh them. Now, as I said, 
Nobody lives at the 20-year average either. Everybody lives day to day. And so we also want to look at how these changes in sort of average temperature affect the sort of extremes and heat waves and the like. Now, one particular sort of extreme that our group has done a bunch of work on is the combined extreme of heat and humidity, um, which we all sort of know through our lived experience, right? So if you're in D.C. in the middle of the summer, that feels very different than if you're in Phoenix in the middle of the summer, even if, they're, you know, even if it's 100 degree Fahrenheit days in both. Um, so that nice figure there of a sweaty man is, is uh, from a, a column I had in the, in the, in the Sunday Review a, a few months ago. Um, I had nothing to do with it, but it was a good art selection on the part of the Times. Um, these maps are showing you the number of what we would call so dangerously hot and humid days in a typical summer. Again, those tames two different scenarios. So what do we mean by dangerously hot and humid? Think of in New York City, it's about the worst one and a half days in a typical summer. In DC, it's about the worst four days in a typical summer. Um, and so we can say that under that high emission scenario, there's about a 60% chance that mid-century Manhattanites will experience more dangerously humid days than Mississippians do today, whereas getting on the low emissions trajectory gives you 90% chance that you will probably have more than DC does today, but less than Mississippi does. Now, you know, I, I tend to think of these in terms of human health impact, but it's also important to remember that livestock you know, that are, are also animals, and they also are affected by the combination of heat and humidity. Um, and so to think about that as, as we plan uh, for the future. So those are the heat extremes. And the heat is really the, the thing that's easiest to predict because what we're doing with climate change is pumping more heat into the planet. Changes in rainfall are harder to predict because we're doing a bunch of different things. We're increasing evaporation. We're putting more water vapor into the atmosphere. We're shifting weather patterns. Um, and so all of the gray on these maps are basically showing you areas where it's kind of ambiguous what the, what the trends are going to be over the century in a high emission scenario. But there are some clear signals you can see, such as that uh, springtime increase in precipitation in the northeastern two-thirds of the country and a drying in the southwest. Now we take all these projections and we combine them with a vast body of empirical work that's been developed over the last decade or so looking at the relationship between climate variability and weather variability in various parts of the economy to come up with estimates of the risk associated in different sectors with this. Um, and so two sorts of risk I want to highlight, and we've looked at six in the main report that there, where there's an adequate body of work to characterize, are changes in yields of commodity crops and changes in the number of hours people in what we call a high risk sector, so that's basically outdoors work like agriculture as well as manufacturing, um, will change if current practices and current levels of adaptation to, to practices continue. And so one thing you note from these figures is that where you are matters a lot. Um, some parts of the country may actually experience an increase in yield under current practices because the, um, of a fact called carbon fertilization. Put more CO2 in the atmosphere, um, some plants will grow, grow better. Unfortunately, it looks like that's also associated with a reduction in nutrition um, in the plants because they produce less protein when they, when they grow faster. So this sort of would overstate that effect. Um, but this is also sort of, it's not a deterministic view of the future. This is, again, what we have to, the risk we have to manage. So over the last two days, we've heard a lot about changing the structure of the food system, right? And so this is the current food system. And so when we think about changing the structure of the food system, we think about how whatever new food system we're developing will respond to the sort of stresses that would cause these sorts of risk in, a, um, in an emerging climate. Now, I want to highlight the labor productivity figure on the right, because that's the one we don't hear about as much in this context. But in fact, the largest economic risk facing the US as a result of climate change are effects on human health and the effects on labor productivity. And so you know, we were just hearing about sort of labor rights and human rights issues associated with agricultural workers. Right? This is the observed reduction in number of hours, based on the observed reduction in number of hours people work in hotter days. So how that actually plays out is going to depend upon, you know, do bosses require people to work on these hotter days, in which case you're going to get some of that reduction in labor productivity turned into a health impact. Um, but that's another stress we have to keep in mind. So the second point is, you know, those were sort of 20-year late century averages, but again, 
Like a lot of the effects of climate change happen with these changes in extremes. So these figures, these sort of spaghetti figures, are showing you for three different possible futures how many extreme, what we would consider sort of current one in 20 year crop loss events the current food system would have if faced with the climate distribution of the future. So under the lowest emission scenario, what was once a sort of one in 20 year reduction in yield nationally, we expect to see by the end of the century a fourfold increase of rent and, uh, in risk, so becoming more of a one in five year event. Whereas under the high emissions scenario, it becomes more of a one in two year event by the late century. So it, more of a, uh, a tenfold increase in risk. So one thing you can take away from that is one, there's a, a real difference in risk depending on which of those scenarios you're under. But two, regardless of which one you are, there's something that we will have to manage. So much as Peter was saying earlier, right? We, there, we've got to manage the things that we can't avoid. And what, this, what these different scenarios are showing you is that there are some things we can't avoid and that has to be built into the new food system you guys are developing. Now, our work, our quantitative work has focused on the United States. But in fact, most of the largest impacts are probably going to happen outside of the United States. So these are some works from another approach. And just showing you, like if you look at wheat yields and corn yields especially, you see these really large projected decreases in low latitude countries, countries which probably don't have the capacity that we have to absorb some of these shocks, um, and which may have spillover effects. And I focused on particularly the effects of crop yield and on worker, worker health. But there are many other effects that we don't yet have the research needed to quantify as well. Um, but you know, the carbon fertilization and temperature effects, for instance, weeds will, will benefit from that just as much as crops will. And so we expect to see an increase in weeds. Similarly, pests like the European corn borer bore, uh, figured here, um, diseases like the corn fungus shown. Um, Soil erosion has a result of that increased precipitation and, as I've already mentioned, livestock health, additional risks we need to be thinking about. And at the risk of sounding a little bit of a, a doom and gloom uh, speaker, we also have to remember that all of these are taking place in a broader context outside of the food system. Uh, where there are a lot of risks we really don't know how to quantify, like how ecosystems will respond and what the consequences of those potential ecosystem responses are for us. Or you know, what will happen in some of these countries that are also being stressed by disruptions of weather patterns, climate refugees. We've seen in Europe what the effects have been of a large-scale migration of people um, you know, what happens if climate change makes that more common? And then there's, of course, what former Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld would call the unknowns unknowns. Now, the problem with risk assessment is that it does leave you sort of gloomy. Um, because, of course, the point of assessing the risks, though, is so that you can manage them. And we have two ways of managing these things, right? We can either adapt to the changes, or we can try to get on a scenario where less of them happens. And really, we have to do both. Um, and so I want to leave you just on one moderately good note on the uh, getting off of, of that high end emissions trajectory note, which is that I think that in five years we will be able, not be able to call that red path business as usual anymore. So this figure is showing you in the blue that high end trajectory and in the, in the green what will happen if countries follow through on the pledges they're making as part of the UN process. So if countries follow through on that, then the 2020s, based on independent analyses of those pledges, may be the first decade in, in, since the Industrial Revolution where economic growth has been decoupled from growth in, in greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a good first step. Unfortunately, it's only a first step um, because stable emissions don't mean a stable climate. They mean a stable growth rate of temperature. Right? To, to, to stop further climate change, we need to bring emissions down to zero. So there are risks. We have to manage them. And for some of them, the best way of managing them is to get off of that, of that path and bring emissions down. For other of them, as we rebuild the food system in the ways you guys are pursuing, uh, we just need to build in the, these expected shocks and stresses into them to make not just a more sustainable food system, but a more resilient food system. Thanks. And I think I have time for at least one question. No? Every, yeah. So you talked about limiting outputs, obviously, but I don't know if this is 
I said you talked about limiting output, but I don't know if you are also comfortable commenting on, say, increasing our ability to sequester carbon through soil yeah. initiatives. Yeah, so, so absolutely. That's, a, that's an important part of the process. So those, are, those emissions I was showing you were net land use emissions. So that's including, uh, right, right now, the, you know, we're doing a lot more of the emitting through land use change than we are through taking up. But you know, in, that, in that, green, that bottom scenario, we got to zero emissions in 2080. The only way to get to zero emissions and even negative emissions, which actually happened beyond that, is to increase sinks. And one of the best ways of doing that is through, through things like reforestation. Anyone else? Thank you.